You're watching The Blockchain Interviews, hosted by Dan Weisskopf. Each episode features interviews with leading industry experts so that viewers can have a deeper understanding of today's quickly evolving blockchain marketplace. Today we're here with Jonathan Solomon. I'm thrilled to have you in the Blockchain Interview Series. Jonathan is the co-founder of Digital Mint, and um, a lot of people may be surprised that that the kiosks exist to buy Bitcoin. Um, I certainly um, was surprised in certain respects. Here I am in New York City, and I've got an app. Um, but there are four or five different places where I can buy Bitcoin through kiosks. Um, there are 26,000 kiosks now uh, out there, and that's up from 4,000. This is, this is really a growing opportunity. And Jonathan Solomon and his, his co-founder um, were early adopters in building out a very interesting business. Um, and so Jonathan, you know, thanks for, thanks for joining us in the blockchain interview series. I'm always loving to talk to entrepreneurs, particularly blockchain and crypto entrepreneurs. Well, thank you very much for having me, Dan. I'm, I'm happy to be here and happy to tell uh, my story and the story of Digital Mint today. Yeah. Uh, you know what? Uh, walk us through a little bit about your background, um, you know, uh, more about the company in general um, and how you found uh, your partner, by the way. Sure, sure. Um, so we started the company back in, in 2014, and I, I have been taking a good long look at, you know, Bitcoin probably since 2009, 2010. Um, you know, my background, like a lot of people I find in uh, the blockchain cryptocurrency space is a little unorthodox. Um, I'm, I'm an attorney by training and uh, I found myself, you know, working uh, at various startups uh, or in this space before we even um, started this company. So I was involved in the startup space. I moved to Chicago and I, I knew I was interested in entrepreneurship and I had this law degree I just completed, had to, had to do something with it. So I, I joined a small uh, boutique firm here in Chicago that was doing a lot of uh, business startup work, uh, entity formation, some light IP, intellectual property, copyrights, um, you know, domain registration, um, help with that. And I was found myself constantly helping other entrepreneurs start their businesses. And I really had this itch to start my own. Um, now, at the same time, I was really involved actually in the meetups here in Chicago. Um, maybe there's not so many of those happening right now due to COVID and all that. But at the time, you know, there was, that was a great way to meet other people who are interested in, in technology um, and things that you were interested in. And uh, when I first moved to Chicago, I was thinking, okay, they've got a little bit more of a startup scene here than uh, where I uh, went to law school in Michigan. And um, coming from Buffalo, New York, which actually has come into its own now. But um, at the time, uh, back in, in 2014, there, there wasn't a whole lot uh, going on. And I went to a Bitcoin meetup and it was about uh, nine uh, individuals. And some of them, I think about a third of them were there for less than above board reasons. Uh, they were interested in you know, maybe using Bitcoin for some of the shadier things that we, we heard about in the earlier days. There's also a couple of traders and a couple of uh, technologists. But the one thing that all of us were there for meeting in this mall food court um, in uh, in downtown Chicago was we were there because we had this common interest of what what the heck is Bitcoin? What the heck is this technology? Um, and, uh, you know, when I first had you know discovered Bitcoin, I was healthily skeptical of it. Um, I had some skepticism, you know, it, to me, it sounded like video game money, World of Warcraft money, Second Life dollars. Um, you know, how could this be valuable to anyone in the real world until I went ahead and said, you know, I'm going to purchase some Bitcoin. And in order to uh, to do that, I, I, I really realized the real power in this technology that, you know, for the first time, we have this scarce digital asset that, you know, anyone can send and receive. They don't have to ask permission to do it. And you can transfer uh, money instantly across the entire world, basically as easy as sending an email. And that that really spoke to me. I had like the same kind of tingling feeling I had as a kid when I first got into computers and um, I was trying to figure out how to get games to run on my own old MS-DOS system, installed Linux on my mom's computer when I was 14, really dry, drove for crazy doing that. And, um, you know, that same kind of like passion about technology that I really had not maybe felt in a while when I sent my first Bitcoin transaction and received some. 
Um, so fast forward a little bit, I really became obsessed with that during law school and I wanted to, to do something with startups. So I started going to, to these Bitcoin meetups and um, meeting some like-minded people, I found that, hey, there are people who are actually looking at ways to, to start businesses around this. I, I learned about a company called Coinbase. I became their customer and um, eventually um, had reached out through Reddit and, um, and worked for them for a while. Um, and that was a really interesting experience because it just shows, you know, the power of the internet. So here I was uh, uh, working at a law firm, um, also, you know, transitioning, working at, at Coinbase full time, um, trying to knock on the doors of major retailers who never heard about Bitcoin. You know, uh, they're accepting all their payments at this point through credit cards, maybe a special process for accepting an ACH or a check if, if they could. Um, and saying, you know, I think your customers should should be interested in Bitcoin. And that was a really uphill battle. It was it was hard at the time in 2014. But, you know, nowadays there's hundreds of thousands of retailers that that accept Bitcoin. Um, so back to, you know, back to Chicago and the meetups. That first meetup was cool. I met some interesting folks and I decided I'm going to keep doing this. I'm going to, you know, take charge. I'm going to uh, organize uh, meetups with, with other folks. I met some people who were, you know, somewhat established in the Bitcoin industry. There's a gentleman by the name of Andreas Antonopoulos. I encourage anyone to check out uh, some of his, uh, some of his recordings on YouTube. He does a great job explaining a lot of the fundamental basic concepts of A, how Bitcoin works and, and B, why it's, you know, an important technical, technological innovation um, in our time. And, uh, you know, we actually ended up co-hosting a meetup, uh, having Andreas as a speaker. And um, through this process of throwing meetups, I, I managed to convince a, uh, a bar owner at the time um, to allow me to have a number of folks come in uh, and, you know, and host this meetup. He wasn't sure we were going to have anybody there, but I said, I think I can fill your bar on a night that it's generally empty and I can get, you know, 60 people to come in. And they're going to buy pizza and beer and they had a bowling alley next door. They can go bowling and buy rounds of bowling with, with Bitcoin. And um, this was actually right before I started working at Coinbase. Might have helped me um, get a leg into there initially. Um, but I set up a, a really simple um, application, uh, coded most of it myself and Ruby on Rails to allow you know, a QR code to be displayed on my iPad show some, you know, I could type in the amount that the, uh, uh, the waiter or waitress was uh, going to charge somebody for their beer and pizza and say, okay, you bought $20 worth of uh, pizza, type that in the iPad, I could show them a QR code. And then voila, you know, the Bitcoin would be transferred from their wallet. And I would, it was going actually into my wallet at the time, there was <laughs> no, no uh, business behind it. And, uh, you know, I ended up paying cash for everybody's uh, meals at the end of the night. And uh, I kept the Bitcoin. Um, and, and so essentially, I <laughs> acted as the payment processor back in 2014 for this bar and um, to accept uh, Bitcoin. And uh, so that it's an interesting story, because it was that one of those events where I actually met my co-founder. And, you know, we, we, you know, loosely kept in touch in the early days. And I think this is why, you know, networking is, uh, is so important because A, the fact that I was able to run this event um, was probably some ammunition for me when I was talking to the folks at Coinbase in the early days, which I, we were talking through Reddit at first, right? Um, I, I hadn't gotten to the HR screening or, or any other steps of the interview, interview process. I was just DMing them on Reddit. Hey, check out, you know, this, uh, here's a tweet, check out this event that we did. And, uh, you know, I was able to, to leg that into a job where I was getting paid in Bitcoin to, um, to sell Coinbase's services to merchants. Um, later on during that time, you know, my co-founder and I at Digital Mint um, had talked about, let's put a couple of Bitcoin ATMs around Chicago. Uh, let, let's see, you know, what, what that can do. Um, you know, I'd thrown the idea around Coinbase. I wasn't sure if that would get me in any kind of trouble there. I was all excited about my new job back in crypto in 2014. And, you know, everyone's like, no, no, that's a great hobby project. Uh, we're, we're really excited for you. And I think that's actually one thing Coinbase has done right um, is, you know, you hear about the PayPal mafia. Uh, there's a bit of a Coinbase mafia out there. Are a lot of uh, early employees who, you know, maybe learned the ropes um, or gained a lot of knowledge there and went on to, to start their own, um, to start their own businesses, which is really cool. Um, but anyway, fast forward to um, the end of 2014, and we, myself and Mark, my co-founder, had placed a couple of kiosks around Chicago. And, you know, we were surprised to see how successful they were. Surprised because, just like you said, you know, people really going to be buying 
um, Bitcoin from a from a what looks like an ATM machine. Well, yeah, um, and they were uh, you know we put them in in a technological center geared towards you know an underserved population on the south side of Chicago, um, and that machine proved wildly successful. And it was not you know the same sorts of customers you know that we thought we would be. Um, initially seeing, you know, our office was inside a, a tech incubator downtown and, you know, it was all, you know, just very, very the same, very much the same demographic um, of, of individuals, males and their white males in their 20s buying Bitcoin. Um, yet what we were seeing at the kiosk was a very different demographic. Um, people of all of all different um, shapes, sizes, economic backgrounds, what have you, uh, were interested in purchasing uh, Bitcoin from us. And you know there was something to it because there 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 was a lot of activity. You know, I had um, early, in the early days, I was almost concerned from a compliance standpoint um, before I even knew what the whole compliance picture looked like. I'm talking really early, and a customer of ours had transacted you know twenty five over twenty thousand dollars say in a in a short period of time, maybe a month. Um, he was a, a young African American guy on the south side of Chicago, and I I had to ask what what are you what are you doing. And, um, you know, what are, what are you purchasing with Bitcoin? He was a little hesitant at first also because Bitcoin, one of the selling points is supposed to be, hey, this is, you know, pseudo anonymous currency. So this company that you just purchased Bitcoin from calling you up. Uh, but we went out, we went out for dinner and we chatted and I learned about his business where he was selling, importing human hair from China, from India and selling it um, to beauty shops around Chicago and beyond. And I had never even, you know, I wasn't aware that this was a trade I, you know, I, um, my hair is pretty easy to deal with. So I, you know, I'm not, I, I've never heard of this before. So this was really interesting. And it turns out it's a multi-million dollar um, industry. And, uh, you know, I said, well, so why Bitcoin? You know, why, why not use PayPal? Why not do a wire transfer? Well, you know, he was a young guy and didn't, was somewhat tr distrustful uh, of banks and their fees and, and their onboarding process and structure there. Um, and, and the other part, though, is he goes, I honestly would have paid PayPal, but uh, Bitcoin was what the seller overseas was demanding. And I dug into that a little bit. Well, why? Why, why, is, why is this vendor that you're using demanding Bitcoin? Well, it turns out the reason that the vendor was asking for Bitcoin was because of the instantaneous nature and the irreversibility that, um, you know, not, not the individual I was talking about, but others, you know, buying, they, they had on chargeback reversals that these overseas vendors, they didn't have recourse to, you know, call an American bank and say, hey, that transaction um, is, is valid. The, the bank is going to side with their American customer and, and be done with it. So after dealing with a number of chargebacks, Bitcoin just ended up because of how quick and efficient it is to, to send, be the requested, um, you know, uh, currency of the day there. Um, and I, I encountered other situations like this too, where we were talking. So, so, with, John, so Jonathan, sorry, I just want to inter interject. Um, so, so you met your partner, um, mm -hmm. you hit it off. Did you, you know, your co-founders, do you have different roles? Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm CEO, um, Mark Renz, uh, my co-founder, he's the president and, uh, his background, you know, he comes from the financial industry. He's, uh, worked at Schwab, um, Hightower Advisors. So he's got a very solid um, you know, financial um, asset management background. Uh, myself, I've, you know, I've, I've always been a technologist, you know, uh, tinkering with computers, dabbling with uh, programming, although I wouldn't hold myself out as a you know, full stack developer or anything like that. And uh, with my legal background. So we kind of had this really nice yin and yang um, where, you know, he was able to, um, help a lot on the, on the sales and financial, uh, side of things and a pretty smart guy around technology too. We both had that technology aspect and I was able to bring a lot of the, the legal and compliance. And, um, we just have a different way of thinking about things, which, you know, it's, it's nice. I, I know that, um, you know, some, some companies do well with, uh, two strong individuals leading and, and some, um, you know, it's, it's better to have just kind of one, one strong person, but I think ultimately it's great to have somebody to lean on because building a company is really, really hard. And to have somebody with like very similar values to you and interested in, in building and, and, and creating something um, is, is great. So two young guys got together, uh, fast forward. Um, you're now, you have like what, 35, 36 employees. Um, actually, we're, we're just about to hit 50 now. Yep. 
Um, so we're, Fantastic. you know, we, yeah, we started off with, uh, it was just the two of us in a, a little room in a tech incubator. Um, and, you know, now we've got, you know, 50 employees all around uh, the country, really. We've got some remote, uh, majority are, are in Chicago here, but, uh, you know, we're, we've really built, you know, we're build, continue to build a financial institution. Talk to us a little bit about where your kiosks are located geographically. Sure. So, uh, you know, one of the things we realized when we were looking at our customers and, and the use cases is, you know, what you're, you're using this for payments, you're using this as a store of value, um, you know, why? Um, and, and a lot of our customers, they felt disenfranchised by the current financial system. Either there was not geographic access um, or banks were inconvenient or they felt screwed over by a bank before. You know, banks have collected hundreds of billions of dollars every year in, in fees, whether that's interest, overdraft fees, what have you. There might even be a fee. You know, you don't have enough money in your bank account. So someone is essentially your bank is punishing you for being poor and they're going to take more money and, right. and make your situation even worse. Um, so we found that, you know, where, where else do these individuals who are transacted with Bitcoin, what else, what, what, what other aspects of their financial lives can we learn about? We learned that a lot of them conduct transactions and check cashing stores, uh, currency exchanges, uh, financial service centers, what have you. And uh, these stores play a really important role um, because they, they fill in what are called financial deserts. You hear about, you know, Whole Foods um, going into underserved neighborhoods. Uh, because they're the existence of food deserts. And um, that's a good thing to provide you know, services to people who are not currently um, being served well by, the, by whatever system, whether it's the food supply chain or the or financial system, right? And uh, so we, we made connections. Um, Chicago is actually a, a kind of a mecca for the uh, currency exchange, check cashing, financial service center industry. And, uh, you know, we, we walked into one of uh, our, our partners who we still continue to work with to this day in their office and say, hey, we want to put, a, let us put a Bitcoin ATM in your lobby. And uh, it took a while to even get their attention at first because, uh, you know, the, we had left a few messages, sent a few emails. And one of the uh, principals there said to me, why the heck would our customers want to buy Bitcoin? You know, they're, they're living, some of them are living paycheck to paycheck or they're, you know, they're, they're doing all their payments through, you know, they're coming in to pay their electric bill, to pay their phone bill. Um, you know, they're not really investing. Uh, why would they buy Bitcoin? And I, you know, I said, just, just bear with us. Let's, let's do an experiment and put one of our kiosks in your lobby and see what happens. And they were astounded because a couple of weeks later they said, oh my gosh, your customers are our customers. And we started to hear stories of individuals who would go and they would, you know, cash a check or maybe they had cash from, you know, a, a whatever job they had, they were getting paid in cash. And they were going up to the counter, cashing the check, then walking straight over to the Bitcoin ATM and putting that cash into there and, um, you know, putting it into their own wallet, maybe sending it, uh, you know, to a, to a different wallet. And there was some really, really savvy individuals too. And, uh, and this is a, you know, a legitimate activity. This is a, a savings account for some people. Now, there's a lot of criticism out there. Well, you know, you don't want to use Bitcoin as a long-term, excuse me, store of value because of the volatility aspect. But overall, in a long enough time frame, you know, it, it's continued to go up. And I'd like to think most of these individuals, they weren't only in, in Bitcoin, but this was just one financial product that they had never really had access to before. They weren't investing in stocks and bonds. And now for the first time, some of these folks were you know, having the ability to invest and, and use Bitcoin um, as that tool for investment. So, so Jonathan, um, uh, a long, long time ago, when I did my master's thesis on pawn shops, you've heard me tell you tell this story. Um, yeah. The average um, transaction uh, was like seventy dollars, right, at a pawn mm -hmm. shop. But your average transaction is is what? Um, it, it, it varies month to month. I think, you know, between 250 to $500, um, depending on, on the time of year. And, and are we looking at, at similar demographic? Uh, as, as when we, uh, as the pawn shop demographic. Yeah. I, I think that, you know, we talk about alternative, uh, financial systems, you know, um, the FDIC, um, Federal Reserve, there's studies out there that say, you know, between five and 20%, depending on the metric you use, are unbanked, underbanked. But let's just say, you know, underserved, right? Folks are who, for some reason, the, the, the dominant, you know, banking things that we might use in our daily lives, um, you know, people in the financial services industry 
uh, are there's another there's a whole another financial system out there where it doesn't make sense to have an American Express card. It doesn't make sense sure. to have a, an account at a, at a major uh, bank. And one of the reasons is because of those fees I talked about, right? That, you know, someone's reaching into your pocket and saying, yo, you, you dropped below $500. Well, we're going to take out a, a fee there. And so um, there, our customers are seeking out, you know, this as a way of saving, as a way for paying for things, as a way for sending money across the world to individuals, as a way for, you know, as a form of entertainment too. Um, and, and it's, it's really, uh, this is we've, what we've discovered, just like the pawn shop, is that this is where people are living their, fi their daily financial lives. I mean, not many of us uh, walk into a, a bank branch as much as probably we used to 10 years ago. Um, but, you know, there are areas that don't even have bank branches. And mm -hmm. so what they might have is a check cashing store. They might have a pawn shop. They might have a payday lending store. And these have become de facto banks. I mean, I've heard stories of customers who said they'd rather go uh, to a check cashing store and deposit their funds because at least it'll be available to they'll get the cash right there. Um, they can use that cash where I go and deposit a, a check from um, Uncle Joey and, you know, it, my bank, his bank, until they work it out, I might not have that $300 for three or four days. So there's also this instantaneous aspect of like immediate access to your, to your funds. Now, are your, are your uh, kiosks uh, concentrated in any particular state? Uh, we have, you know, quite a few in the Midwest and Illinois, but we're actually all over the country now. We're um, in 38 states. Uh, we have about just over a thousand locations. Uh, about half of them are kiosks. And uh, the other half of those are either we have a direct integration into a point of sale system. So a customer comes in and just talks to the store employee, like as if they're buying a gift card or a lottery ticket or anything else in the store. Um, and we're just an option for the employee to click on their screen and say, hey, sell this guy, this woman Bitcoin. Um, and the, or we also have another product where you know, a store might not have a, um, a point of sale system that's sophisticated enough. And we will uh, give them an iPad that has our proprietary software on it. And that iPad will allow them to you know, act as our agent, much as someone could be an agent of Western Union or an agent of a MoneyGram, RIA. Um, those traditional money transfer services, well, you know, it's, it's really legally and um, through the regulatory lens, the same thing. Your store is becoming our agent. We're giving you an iPad or an integration into your point of sale system. And now you can sell cryptocurrency with digital net. Interesting. And, and your legal background, I'm sure, helped you out um, with the regulations, right? Um, because your industry, like my industry, like the pawn shop industry, are highly regulated. Talk to us Have, about that heavily regulated yeah i will say it definitely gave me a leg up in and reading and understanding um i studied a lot of administrative law uh when i was in law school um and so but the, you know it what that allowed me to do is take a look at these statutes talk to regulators talk to experts and at least ask the right questions or even be able to find people who are smarter or more knowledgeable than me and get them in the room to to ask some of those questions i think that's you know really important as a as a leader of a company that you know you could recognize to you know put people in the room smarter than you to help you get things done and um it, it definitely you know the legal background helped there but the regulatory landscape um is you know some refer to it as a wild west i'll say you know there's maybe some aspect in the sense that this is a new technology and regulators are still trying to grasp it and there's some truth to that term but you know our my industry has been regulated um on the federal level since 2013. Um, FinCEN came out with guidance in, in 2013. Uh, Jennifer Shasky Calvary was the head of FinCEN at the time during the Obama administration and said, you know, this is money transmission. This is money service business activity uh, if you're buying and selling Bitcoin for US dollars or vice versa. And uh, that at least, you know, allowed us to narrow the scope and say, okay, what, what rules do we have to comply with? Well, it turns out it's a lot of the same rules that a Western Union or a MoneyGram um, or, or any other a money transmitter type business would have to comply. And they've just been kind of bolted onto this new technology in somewhat awkward way, but also manageable. Um, and so, you know, part of that is, you know, establishing a compliance program and, and um, important part of that is knowing your customers. You know, everyone in finance knows KYC. You know, do you know who you're dealing with? Uh, do you have controls in place to ensure that, um, you know, that, you're not sending money to um, money launderers, terrorists, criminals, that you're, you've got controls in place for criminal activity. 
And uh, that was really important to us early on. So we knew that we were, you know, federally regulated. And part of that also is every state has its own set of uh, regulations as well. And um, most, most states will have a money transmitter statute um, on the books. And, you know, it's been interesting throughout, you know, our business, we've been around since 2014. So during that time, we've seen states take different positions. You know, New York, as you mentioned, they've got um, their own bit license regime. So it's not even um, the money transmitter statute. They've built their own specific virtual currency uh, regime around that, where some states have said, no, no, we're going to bolt on our existing uh, money transmission um, you know, we're going to call this money transmission like the federal government has. But what that means is, okay, we have regulators on the federal level, excuse me, and we also have regulators on, you know, each, each state level. And some states, you might even look at the statute, right, and say, okay, Texas um, calls us this, and this other state has the same uh, language as Texas, but Texas calls us X and they call us Y. And there's no reason except that's just a decision somebody made in, in an office somewhere. But that's fine. Part of you know what we've gotten good at is learning to have the conversations with regulators and say, you know, what do we need to do to do business in your state? Um, you know, we've we've also stuck predominantly with Bitcoin, um, selling Bitcoin. We we do sell Litecoin in a handful of locations, and we're turning on some other products. But you know, once you step into um, you know some of, some of the other tokens that are out there, you start to implicate the SEC. You might um, Im implicate the CFTC. Uh, the CFPB has raised their hand and said they want a hand in regulating. And so I think, you know, in the future, we're going to see, um, I think that one of the themes of 2022 that we'll see is that a lot of the regulators will be sort of fighting over, um, you know, regulating our space a bit more. And, um, you know, we've got our sleeves rolled up to, to handle that. But right now we have a really clear picture of who regulates us, to, us today and, and how to handle that. And, you know, some of the, uh, the concerns we're seeing out there, you know, we're, we're not anti-regulation. I think that there's a ton of uh, fraud in our industry, cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, it's a, it's a very powerful tool. You can send an, an amount of uh, value across the planet instantly. And part of what makes that so powerful is also irreversible. That also makes it dangerous uh, to some folks. You know, you're, there's a lot of uh, those scams. I'm sure we've all gotten it where you get a text message or a phone call and it's the, the IRS or the Social Security in, uh, Administration. And uh, if you don't, you know, go to a crypto kiosk and buy uh your life savings in Bitcoin and send it right away, we're going to put you in jail. And of course, that's not the IRS, that's not the government on the other end, but there are some vulnerable individuals who fall for that kind of thing. And so, you know, where we want to see the regulation uh, focused is, you know, how do we stop people from getting defrauded by this technology? We're, we're really big fans of it. We think it's very powerful, but we want to keep our community of customers safe as well. Yeah, yeah, smart regulation is what we're all hoping for, and and for um, sure. um, okay, so so in in a, in in a short manner, tell us what the benefit is to um, buying Bitcoin on a kiosk over just simply an app. Sure. Well, I think one of the uh, the biggest thing, just like the reason that any of us would use an ATM, right? Often our kiosks are are compared to ATM machines, even though you're putting cash in our system and getting crypto out where traditional ATMs work the other way, where you've got some digital form of cash and your online bank balance and you're getting cash out of the machine, right? Um, but the benefit of, of you know, going with us versus one of the online uh, platforms is really the instantaneous nature of you. We, we might not even know who you are. You could be a brand new customer, but we can, you know, do the KYC aspect, the things our regulators hold us to. We can, we can verify your identity. We can um, ensure that, you know, that we can take a look at the address that you presented to our system and make sure that it's not, um, you know, fraudulent and or or connected to legal activity. A lot of folks, you know, don't don't know that that's the case. Um, so we can keep you safe, and uh, we can verify the ID. We can get your Bitcoin address, and we can transact within a matter of minutes. All of this can happen you know, within five, 10 minutes, um, the part where the customer's in front of the screen really only lasts two minutes, right? So uh, all, the, all of a sudden that, that cryptocurrency is in your wallet ready to be used in a matter of minutes. Um, other ways of going about this that require A, that you might have a bank account. So if you're trying to buy Bitcoin and not use um, a kiosk to do so, or not use one of our cash to Bitcoin locations, you're going to have to sign up for a service. Um, you know, they might be able to verify your ID right away, but they're still relying on the legacy banking rails like ACH or maybe wire transfer 
those things take time, right? A wire, maybe you can do it same day, next day. Um, ACH, some banks, depending, can do same days, um, some won't, but there's a waiting period. Um, and part of that too is the fraud risk, because if I'm at a computer signing up for account, you don't know that I'm not, you know, um, somebody I'm, you know, in some other country who doesn't look like me and speaks a different language is trying to defraud me. Um, and so a lot of times companies in this space who are dealing with bank transfers, they have to wait to make sure that that bank transfer won't be reversed. We've got a customer's cash in a metal drawer or metal box. So we can be confident that there's not going to be a chargeback that's you know, connected to some kind of fraud. So we can release the customer's uh, coin you know, pretty much immediately. And that's really powerful to folks. If you're, um, you know, if you're paying a vendor overseas, for example, um, or you're paying a developer and waiting for them to push your code to the app store. A lot of people work with you know, uh, developers overseas who might not have access to the US banking system. They may be demanding cryptocurrency as a form of payment and they, they're not gonna push your code live till today or until they get paid. And if you want that to happen today, we're often you know, the best option because we can do these things instantaneously um, and we can verify your identity. We can make sure you're not getting defrauded. You know, same day, uh, these don't take you know, a, a three or four days or a week like it does on many other platforms out there. So you, you use the greenback to transfer instantaneously and you can't do that on an app. People forget right. that, right? Yeah, yes. I, I can't insert a dollar bill into my phone. <laughs> no, no. Now on the other side, um, there's a benefit to the business, right? It's, it's not a lot of square footage. It's not a lot of man hours. It's, it's all about the convenience and it's a little extra margin, right? Yeah, exactly. Well, how, should I hire you for my sales team, Dan? <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, that, that's really, I mean, a lot of it is you, you pointed it out perfectly is that, you know, we need three feet square, three square foot of space uh, for a kiosk. If it's a store, um, or if we're going to put it behind the counter, then we don't need any space at all. We just need a drawer for you to put our iPad in or use your existing point of sale system. We just become an app on your existing software. And then maybe we need a few minutes of your employee's time when someone comes in to buy Bitcoin. And most stores that we talk to don't mind that um, it, because what that enables is more foot traffic, right? You're attracting people to your store who might otherwise be in there. So they come in and uh, they, they come in to buy Bitcoin and they walk out with you know, a Gatorade and beef jerky or something. So, and, and that sale might not have happened if it wasn't for us uh, bringing the customer in. So, uh, you know, it's additional foot traffic. And, you know, of course there's a revenue share aspect to it too. So we have stores who are making hundreds of dollars a month, if not more, um, just by virtue of placing a kiosk in their corner or, or connecting us with their, with their point of sale systems. So if there are 26,000 kiosks today, um, and there were 4,000 last year. Mm -hmm. Where are we going to be in 2022 or 2023, et cetera? Give us like some high level hopes and dreams for your, your sector. Well, so we, I mean, we would like to be anywhere where someone is handing cash over a counter and can purchase a, a financial product, but you know, anywhere that could sell a gift card, essentially, we want to be able to sell Bitcoin. And that's, that's sort of our long-term uh, plan is, you know, be be an on-ramp essentially for folks to take their paper money and get it into in the cryptocurrency. And by the way, we also offer some online services as well, but just to focus on, on that aspect, you know, um, right now you're, there's, tw I think you said 26 or 29,000 um, locations around the country where someone can, can use one of these kiosks. When we start, we have over a thousand now of, of that market. When we started our company, there were barely a thousand around the entire country back in mm -hmm. 2014. So, you know, there's been, a, there's a lot more competition. Um, there's a lot, uh, a lot more places to do. There's other options too. We see other companies getting involved and using slightly different models. They're not using cash, they're using debit card. And that's okay. When I, when I talk to store owners, essentially they want their customers to be able to, you know, pay with whatever they, they have, whether it's a check, whether it's a credit card, as long as the store is getting that value, um, they don't really care what their customers walking in. They just want want revenue. They just want transactions. So you know, we would like to be anywhere cash to X, and and not just Bitcoin too. If you want to, if you have cash or you have uh, some other value uh, of currency, and you want to convert it to Bitcoin, you want to convert it to a gift card, you want to convert it to a bill payment, you want to convert it to Ethereum or heck, say an NFT. Um, we want to be the the company that helps you do that. Um, and, you know, we're, we're doing it in our own very compliant way um, to make sure that the industries that we work with, because we work predominantly with, um, you know, financial service stores, 
check cashers. We work with, you know, on the back end with a lot of uh, banks who are very conservative, um, as, as many banks are, but especially in the money services business industry, to make sure that, you know, they know and our regulators know that we're following the rules and that we're, we're doing it the right way. And we haven't expanded maybe as, as quickly into some markets because we've taken a measured approach and a very conservative approach. And I, I think that will reward us in the long run because, you know, there, there have been things we've said, I think success is just as much about things you've said no to as things you've said yes to. And there's been uh, some, you know, some things that have come our way that, you know, maybe we could have gotten into and we're glad that we stayed away from a certain cryptocurrency or certain product or uh, a certain deal. And so, you know, slow and steady wins the race. And, uh, you know, we're happy with our current growth, but uh, would love to, to continue to do that and be involved in every cash financial transaction that happens. <laughs> well, wait, you know, you, are you a formal lawyer or you're still a lawyer, by the way? Uh, recovering lawyer, I think. Recovering lawyer. <laughs> you, you know, growing appropriately um, and making sure you don't stumble on KYC issues is the only way to go about, you know, this, 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 this industry, right? Because uh, you're dealing with a situation where, where um, you're, the business is hosting um, the, the kiosks are, are kind of collaborators, right? Um, mm -hmm. In, you know, partners, whatever you want to call it, right? Um, if you did it wrong, there would be huge ramifications. So I, I totally respect where you're coming from. So I, I, I always kind of conclude these with two wild card questions, okay? Um, and you've been in the industry for so long on a relative basis, right? Um, which areas, which industries do you think will be most disrupted by cryptocurrency? besides financial services, because that's too much of a layup. For sure. Yeah. Um, well, I think that uh, I'm seeing right now, I predict real estate in a couple of different ways um, and also entertainment. And uh, I see real estate being uh, the concept of an NFT, right? Everybody's talking about NFTs right now. Um, and I'm not talking about the ones Snoop Dogg or Martha Stewart are um, advertising on, on their Twitter feeds, right? I'm talking about just the idea of a a unique transaction on a blockchain that represents something real. And maybe that represents a real estate transaction. So I think the whole idea of, you know, title insurance companies are going to start to realize that, um, you know, keeping records on paper or centralized databases um, is a old legacy way of doing things. And there's efficiencies uh, by, by doing things in a decentralized way where, you know, you're, your home purchase, your title to your home might be represented by an NFT, the title to your car, even um, a title to, a, you know, go to luxury goods. But also, I, I think you're going to see because of the amount of uh, wealth that's been created already in, in Bitcoin and cryptocurrency and uh, the number of investment that it's created a lot of, you know, wealthy entrepreneurs who have cryptocurrency and are, you know, they need a place to live or they're looking for other ways to invest that they don't want to be 100% all in crypto. And so you're going to see some innovative ways. Uh, to invest in, in real estate um, using crypto assets um, with perhaps, you know, tax advantages and um, other, other uh, advantages there that, you know, financial advisors have traditionally talked about. And then um, entertainment is another thing too. And I, I think that, you know, right now, uh, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot being said about NFTs. And at the end of the day, I think that NFTs will still be around five years from now, but they, we won't be so fascinated. They won't be so cool to us. It's essentially you buy something, you get a receipt. That receipt's an NFT, big, big deal, right? You buy something digital or physical and you'll have some sort of blockchain receipt. And so I, I think that, you know, there's a lot of power in this technology and, uh, you know, to, to see the way it's going to develop in a way where it becomes more and more mainstream and it's less of this exotic thing that we're fascinated by and um, more of something that, you know, becomes part of our everyday um, financial and, and uh, daily living. Um, that's, that's where things are heading. And, uh, you know, we just, we're, we're seeking ways to be a part of it. I'm not, you know, there's a lot of buzzwords out there, web three and, uh, you know, blockchain versus Bitcoin. And um, at the end of the day, we're focused on what do our customers want, right? If, if our customers want um, a way to purchase a digital entertainment um, in, in the form of an NFT or, you know, we're happy to accommodate that if that's what, what we're seeing. Um, but we're also, you know, going to continue to provide the hard Bitcoin financial services that we've always done. Um, and do it in a safe and secure way. Um, and, you know, we recently, one thing I will, I do want to say is we started uh, crypto3c.org, 
which is a way for, you know, we're trying to up the standards in our industry. You know, we, we, we do KYC on all our customers. We're doing some, um, inf- you know, we're looking at the transactions um, and making sure that people aren't getting defrauded. And we're working with some other industry leaders to do that as well. We've actually found, you know, developed a database now where anyone who has um, gotten, you know, that feels they've been defrauded by uh, in a cryptocurrency transaction uh, can go and report that so that we can share that database with other companies like us and use that data to keep customers safe because, you know, you know, the regulators are out there, right? And, and we've, we've taken a very friendly approach with them. Um, but there are, there are some actors who are, you know, not listening and not, not caring. They're not doing the KYC. And we, we don't want the regulators to look at our industry and throw the baby out with the bathwater either. Um, so what we're, you know, we're pushing for smart regulation and, um, you know, at the end of the day, we just want to see people transacting these things, whether they're buying real estate, whether they're buying entertainment, placing bets, do it in a way that's safe and secure and not going to uh, get them into any, um, any trouble. So the, the other wild card question I, I like to ask is looking forward 10 years from now, what are people going to say was so obvious that they should have done? related to the blockchain or crypto that we should be thinking about today? Um, it's a stumper. What can I tell you? Yeah, that's, that, that is. A st- <laughs> well, because I, again, I, I think that there are things that, you know, were obvious, uh, you know, to me and not to, not that I'm some scion or, or something, but you know, there was, when I was working at Coinbase um, eight or nine years ago, and I was talking to, you know, major, uh, e-commerce sites, hey, you need to integrate Bitcoin as a payment method, get lost. No one's going to you know, do that. Now it's like a standard Shopify integration, right? Almost any website that ex- accepts Shopify, it's like, do you want to pay with cri- crypto? Just click here. Um, so I think it'll be something like that where uh, we're not using uh, cryptocurrency uh, for yet, but we will be. I, you know, One thing that I think is interesting is even bandwidth, right? Uh, wireless. Uh, there, there's a project out there, not to, I, I own a very insignificant amount of their token called Helium. And it's a uh, essentially a, a, a Wi-Fi type 5G network that is funded by, you know, you mine the token by providing an access point that other people can add. And, and it's proof of coverage instead of proof of work, like Bitcoin, where you have miners just grinding away on, on uh, equations. You have, you know, was your antenna on and pingable by the network? And were you able to provide coverage? Okay, well, now you have a token. And I think that that, that sort of thing, you know, everyone's web browser will just have a wallet in it and we'll all be this big net mesh network connected to each other, whether it's your VR headset or your phone and all of these devices will talk to each other and exchange tokens. And if you're not using your phone, you could allow some of your battery life to mine some token and pay for what, turn off ads on a website in exchange for the token you have. So there's some interesting projects, you know, the Brave Web Browser is doing something like that, where, you know, um, using resources that are just sitting idle, whether it's your computer, whether it's your Wi-Fi antenna, um, whether it's um, you know your your cell phone battery or storage space, where you can part- give some of that to a peer-to-peer network and participate in an economy, um, it'll provide an additional source of income to folks that they might you know not even be thinking of right now. You sparked a lot of a lot of thoughts right there. Um... Uh, people can get involved in the gig economy without knowing it, of course, right? And and mm-hmm. whether it's helium or something else, where and and then a, a, a company like Dish might actually lower its customer acquisition costs and please their customers by offering them the the helium um, uh, token. Yeah, it's a. I mean, I, again, there are you know they transmit information over wires and wireless, right? And so to be able to harness a network like that to continue to, you know, provide services to the world um, and also, you know, give back to their customers or even allow, you know, non-customers to participate. And, you know, there's a, at the end of the day, it's a, it's an exchange of, of goods and services, right? I, I, I might be able to run an antenna someplace where no one else has when I'm providing coverage and I'm going to get paid for that. And then, you know, a company like Boost or Helium, uh, the company behind it, they might use that antenna then to uh, to provide internet access or other services to, to folks. And, you know, the by virtue of someone having an antenna as part of this peer-to-peer network, they're getting paid, they're getting a, a source of that revenue too. I mean, it's almost kind of similar to the way that we'll give a store revenue share uh, when we place a kiosk in there, but it's just, hey, it's an antenna and it's, it's um, you know, it's less uh, formal. There's no contract behind it. It's just a, a blockchain that's constantly, your your system's on and you're getting paid. You're getting a piece of that revenue share. So I think, you know, democratizing those models, um, whether it's internet access, whether it's connectivity, whether it's financial services, 
uh, we're going to see this technology, you know, blockchain technology um, at the center of that really empowering people in ways that, you know, we're not even thinking of yet. Yeah, I love that as a conclusion, right? Where uh, the blockchain empowers people, it provides ways to be become more free. All right. Um, thank you so much for your time today. We we think entrepreneurs who block and tackle every day to to um, participate in the blockchain are a lifeblood of our economy, and and we thank what you do. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Bye bye.